Good afternoon. I want to thank Doug for inviting me here today to talk about an important issue that's been getting a lot of attention lately, and that's what to do when the patient is racist, and what are the legal, ethical, and clinical uh, implications for patients, providers, and healthcare institutions. So I'm going to start with a case study. A 57-year-old man enters the emergency department late one night with shortness of breath and a fever. A nurse does an initial workup and thinks his condition could be serious, so she goes, she calls the, the uh, Dr. Jones, the physician on call, to evaluate the patient. When Dr. Jones enters the room, the patient says, oh my god, I'm glad you're finally here. My television isn't working. Can you just fix it? Dr. Jones explains that she's his physician and she's going to do the evaluation. And the patient gets agitated and turns to the nurse and says, I don't want to be treated by a black doctor. Get this woman out of my room. Get me a real doctor. Now, you can fill in the blank here with respect to the rejected physician. It could be a Latino physician. It could be uh, an Asian physician. It could be a Muslim physician. Any of these categories apply. And in fact, I call this one of medicine's open secrets because you'd be hard pressed to find a physician, but particularly a physician of color, who hasn't had this experience or who doesn't know someone who has. Scenarios such as this are much more common than one would think, occur at hospitals throughout the country, and um, this issue has gotten a lot of attention lately, due in part to our changing social and political climate, as evidenced by um, incidents such as the recent incident up at um, Charlottesville, Virginia, and elsewhere. And what makes these physician-patient encounters so challenging is that they raise many thorny, ethical, legal, and clinical challenges for all the parties involved. So for example, although physicians have an obligation to treat patients, even those patients they find distasteful, these encounters can be painful and degrading for the uh, rejected physician. And scenarios such as this are particularly difficult when the patient is competent, but not stable enough to be sent elsewhere. So before I get too far into this, I want to take a moment to identify the primary groups who are affected when these um, issues occur, these, these uh, patient-physician encounters occur, along with their rights and responsibilities. So we have patients, and for you, uh, most of you are pediatricians, we have patients and families. Um, we have healthcare providers and healthcare institutions. So just as an aside, um, my, my, the case studies that I'm going to use uh, are based on um, uh, adult patients. But as we go through and talk about the case studies, we can tailor it to, uh, uh, we can work in the family and child perspective as well. Okay, so we have patients. What are the, pa let, uh, yeah, let's start with patients. What are the patient's interests? Well, patients have a right to receive stabilizing treatment. This is in keeping with EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. It requires hospitals to screen and stabilize, if necessary, uh, patients in an emergency situation or to arrange for a transfer to a facility able to provide appropriate care. And this is with patient consent. Patients also have a right to refuse medical treatment, which includes the right to refuse wanted treatment from an unwanted provider. So this right to refuse is a well-respected legal and ethical principle that's based in legal, uh, uh, which is based in informed consent and legal rules that protect patients from battery, which is unwanted touching. Uh, many hospitals also have patient bill of rights documents, which include explicit language about a patient's right to refuse treatment from an unwanted physician. So I was recently up at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and here's theirs. And you'll notice at the bottom, it says, you have the right to refuse to be observed, examined, or treated by students or any other staff without jeopardizing your access to care. Okay. So not all hospitals have this uh, language, but many do. So. Let's move on to healthcare providers. Healthcare workers have the duty to treat, but they also have employment rights that have to be respected. So they have a right to a workplace free from certain types of discrimination, specifically discrimination on the basis of sex, race, religion, ethnicity. These are considered legally protected characteristics. Now, institutional rights and responsibilities. Um, Healthcare institutions have to meet EMTALA requirements. So again, this is a federal anti-dumping statute. It requires hospitals, it protects patients from being dumped by hospitals without first being screened or stabilized. Um, 
Institutions also have to protect their healthcare workers' employment rights. So for example, if a healthcare institution continually forces its clinicians to treat or refrain from treating patients who've rejected them on the basis of race or ethnicity, the healthcare institution could be liable for creating a hostile work environment. Okay, so in broad strokes, those are the, the parties whose interests are most directly implicated and their rights and responsibilities. So at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, this is pretty straightforward, I get it. But it can get murkier the deeper you go. So for example, with respect to patients, should the race or ethnicity of the patient matter with respect to how we deal with these cases? So should we distinguish among different types of patients making these reassignment demands? And on the medical provider side, should different types of medical professionals have different rights and responsibilities? So does and should the law distinguish between doctors and nurses or others in these cases? And what about healthcare institutions? Are they damned if they do, damned if they don't? So if they accommodate a patient's demands for a doctor of a different race or ethnicity, are they discriminating against the assigned physician and opening themselves up to legal liability? But if they don't accommodate the patient's demands, will they be liable for, uh, for violating laws against battery by forcing the patient to be treated by an unwanted doctor without consent? But on the other hand, if they don't screen and stabilize the patient, will they be liable for violating EMTALA? So again, what do you do? So my colleagues and I, my, my co-authors here, Alicia Fernandez, um, Bernard Lowe, and Alex Smith and I um, provide guidelines in an article we published in the New England Journal of Medicine called Dealing with Racist Patients. And prior to this, I wrote a lengthier piece published in the uh, UCLA Law Review that looked at the legal uh, implications of, these, uh, of how we deal with these um, reassignment demands. And I have to say, when I first heard about patients demanding different doctors based on race or ethnicity, I was shocked. And my first instinct was, this shouldn't happen, and if it does, these patients most certainly shouldn't be accommodated. So I began researching the issue. And as you know, I'm a law professor, and I research and write on issues that occur at the intersection of bioethics, health law, and anti-discrimination law. So I initially focused my research on looking at the, identifying the laws that could be brought to bear on, these, on, on this phenomena. And this led me to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This is a federal law that bars discrimination on the basis of sex, race, ethnicity, and religion. And Title VII of the Act addresses uh, employment discrimination. Among other things, it says that employers can't cater to the discriminatory preferences of their clientele. So for example, if you went to a restaurant and told the proprietor that you only wanted to be treated by black waiters or you didn't want to be treated by Latino raiders, if the proprietor accommodated your, res uh, your request, she'll have violated Title VII. So this sounds a lot like our hospital scenario, so I assumed I'd find some case, uh, some case law here, but there wasn't any. There have been no reported cases of physicians challenging the accommodation of patient racial preferences under Title VII. And this is so even though, even though we know these types of physician-patient encounters uh, occasionally occur. But there have been several cases brought by another group of healthcare providers um, who've been rejected by patients on the basis of race or ethnicity. Can you guess which group of healthcare professionals I'm talking about? Nurses. nurses, that's right. Look, everybody's got it. Nurses, exactly. Nurses and nursing assistants. And part of the reason is that nurses, and, nurses tend to be employees of the hospitals where they work, while physicians, not always and less so now, but still are often independent contractors. So if a nurse is reassigned um, by her employer, uh, um, then uh, the nurse's employment rights are violated. The hospital or nursing home is violated of Title VII. Um, physicians, on the other hand, in order to maintain their independent contractor status, um, hospitals can't have too much say or control over the manner and means through which they do their work. And even when physicians aren't independent contractors, they tend to have more autonomy to switch out patients and make these sorts of decisions. Um, so physicians aren't being forced to accommodate, but rather tend to decide amongst themselves on individual circumstances and um, thus aren't suing. So again, in broad strokes, that's the legal landscape for healthcare providers and institutions. But it doesn't answer the normative threshold question of whether they should accommodate. So to get at that, let's look at patients. So the case study I opened with is what I imagine most people envision when they think about patients rejecting physicians based on race or ethnicity. But it can often look quite different. So 
let's take a couple real world case studies. So here we have an older Korean man. He goes to the hospital with symptoms that suggest, suggest congestive heart failure. He's, he's provided treatment that offers a very good chance of success, and he'd likely make a full recovery, and all seems to be going well until one day he says he only wants to be treated by physicians in suits. The staff is puzzled by this request, and it's ultimately denied. The patient then becomes increasingly withdrawn and eventually refuses treatment altogether. The hospital performs a competency test. Uh, he's found to be competent. So they respect his wishes, and all treatment is stopped. So this would have been the end of it had not, someone not noticed that he'd filled out a form requesting full resuscitation should he go into cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, when confronted with this seeming contradiction, and after some prodding, the patient asked whether they noticed that his treating physicians were all Japanese or of Japanese descent. The hospital was in Hawaii, which has a large Japanese American population, and the patient was Korean and elderly and remembered Imperial Japan. And he said he didn't trust these physicians. He said he didn't believe that they had his best interests in mind. And the reason he wanted to be treated by physicians in suits is that he noted, noticed that a higher percentage of non-Japanese American physicians uh, wore suits because they also taught in the medical school. So it was a more sort of palatable, more PC way of, of him for, uh, for asking for what he wanted. OK? OK, case study three. Here we have an African-American woman. She presents with symptoms suggestive of renal failure. And she's fairly uncommunicative with her assigned physician. She's giving very reluctant yes and no questions as they try to take her history. And at some point during this process, she sees an African-American doctor treating another patient. And she points and says, I want to talk to him. Why might this patient be discriminating? What's that? She may not trust the other physician. Exactly. Perhaps she's had a positive prior experience with um, uh, uh, an African-American physician. Perhaps she'd had a prior negative experience with a non-African-American physician. But maybe it's simple prejudice. At this point, we don't know. OK. So case study four, the patient is Latina. She arrives in the ER after two weeks of rhinorrhea, sinus pain, and other symptoms suggestive of viral sinusitis. And as she's getting her history taken, she declares she doesn't want the assigned Latino physician. She wants an American doctor. And when asked why she's making this request, she says she came to the US because things are better here, better treatments, better services, and better doctors. And she associates American doctors with white doctors. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. How is the patient's request in scenario three different from the others? Exactly. She's specifically, she's specifically asking for a form of concordance, right? So we see this with women who want a female OBGYN or Muslim patients who m might want a uh, religiously or culturally concordant physician. So in this way, it's a bit different, but it's still discrimination. Now, let's go back to case study two for a second. Physicians may see a similar version of this among veterans who don't want to be treated by a, a, a patient who reminds them of a former enemy combatant, right? Perhaps it's bias, but maybe it's PTSD. So we can argue that discrimination is bad, and it often is, but the idea of discrimination becomes much more complicated in the clinical medical context, particularly in emergency situations where you can't just tell the patient to take the doctor they've been assigned or leave. Um, and sometimes the patient's behavior very clearly seems to be based in bigotry and animus. But other times, it looks different. So what might, what might the patients in um, case study two and three be looking for? What might be underlying their request? Need for trust. Exactly. So you said it also as well. Trust. Now, you know that trust is an important part of the physician-patient relationship, but this is particularly important for patients who are from marginalized or underserved communities. Many studies show they're not as trusting, they're not as confident in the healthcare system, um, and this feeling of mistrust that we see among members of racial minority groups isn't just random paranoia. Studies show that they often have very good reason not to trust the healthcare system. 
Overwhelming evidence shows that racial and ethnic minorities still tend to receive poor quality health care as compared to whites, even when factors such as insurance status is controlled. And some of this is due to structural factors. Um, but research also shows that, sadly, there's still a lot of racial bias in medical practice. And minority patients disproportionately receive substandard health care due to physician prejudice. Now, studies show that most doctors, uh, most clinicians hold non-racist views. But many healthcare providers do harbor implicit biases. Okay. And studies show that physicians' implicit biases um, against ethnic and racial minority patients, particularly black patients, negatively affects clinical relationships, clinical decision making, and health outcomes, and often contributes to the well-documented and widespread uh, health disparities that we see among racial groups. However, data shows that for some patients, particularly patients of color, Physician-patient race concordance can counter the effects of implicit bias, discrimination, and stereotyping by physicians, and in fact, tends to promote more participatory decision-making, greater trust, more productive communication, and greater patient satisfaction. And all of this goes to the core of the physician-patient relationship. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to default to race concordant physician-patient relationships. Instead, all of this is to say that when we hear about patients and their race-based reassignment demands, our first instinct may be to simply deny these requests. But in order to provide appropriate care to all patients, it may be necessary to distinguish between garden variety racism and patients seeking a provider who they feel can understand their experience, who will show them respect, and whom they can trust. So the question then becomes, how can these be accomplished? How can we distinguish be between these types of requests? And then how should we respond? So to get at this, my co-authors and I have devised five ethical guidelines to inform physicians' decision making uh, when these encounters occur. And these factors include consideration of the patient's uh, medical condition, an assessment of the patient's decision making capacity, the reason for the request, the physician's options for responding to the request, and the effect on the physician. And these guidelines can be helpful as you engage the patient through negotiation, persuasion, and then if necessary, accommodation. So let's go through these and apply them to our case studies. In every case, the patient's medical uh, condition should drive clinical decision making. So in an emergency situation, the patient has to be stabilized and uh, treated and stabilized. Now, our algorithm, again, is geared towards um, adult patients, but um, in, in situations with an adult patient, you should also assess the patient's decision-making capacity, because reassignment requests that seem to be based on bigotry can also be due to delirium, psychosis, or dementia. And a patient's preferences may, ch it may change if a reversible disorder is caught and treated. Um, so for example, in the first case study I, I opened with, you might want to check and see if the patient is cognitively impaired. Now, if the patient is competent, then the patient may be open to persuasion. And this goes uh, to uh, the, the parents of a child as well. So a member of the medical staff or an on-call administrator could explain that all the physicians on staff are, are, um, are well qualified, that the patient's health could be jeopardized by any delay caused by trying to find another provider. And while doing this, you want to establish mutually uh, acceptable expectations for the provision of care. Now, the next step in this process is to determine the reason for the request, because often the rationale behind the request is ethically and um, clinically significant. So for example, it may be ethically appropriate to accommodate a reassignment request that's seeking language or cultural concordance. But as we've already discussed, it's not always so clear cut. So for example, in the first cut case study could be its bigotry. Second case study. Maybe it's PTSD. Third case study, is this a patient seeking uh, ethnicity or race concordance? And the fourth, is this a misunderstanding about the, patient, the physician's qualifications? So to get behind, to, to get to the rationale behind the request, you should ask open-ended questions. You can ask the patient or family to tell you more so you can better understand their concerns, all the while acknowledging that these, these conversations are difficult. It may be hard for the patient to uh, be explicit about why they don't want Dr. X, knowing full well that Dr. X is your colleague and perhaps your friend. So you can stress to the patient or the family 
that if they're open with you, you're better able to provide the, the most appropriate care. So you're trying to identify and name what may be underlying the request, which is um, an important part of establishing trust. Now, this can be very effective if you're dealing with anxieties or fears, but it's gonna be less successful if you're dealing with bigotry or animus. So this brings us to the next factor, which is the physician's options for responding to the request. If you're the only physician available, or if you don't want to reallocate staff, or pay, if you don't want to reallocate patients, then you can try to negotiate with the patient or the family to try and allow, um, allow you to provide care until another physician comes on duty. So for patients in case study three and four, this type of negotiation might be effective. Uh, if the patient or family still refuses, then you have to pursue other options. For outpatients, they can be informed of their right to seek care elsewhere if they object to a provider on the basis of race or ethnicity. And for inpatients, if they're stable uh, and the request appears to be based on bigotry, then an administrator could inform the patient or the family of their right to, uh, to seek uh, care elsewhere and, um, and their obligation not to engage in abusive or hateful speech. If the patient and the family still fail to comply, then they can be assisted in transferring to a, uh, another hospital. Now, for patients who aren't stabilized or in an emergency situation, a nurse or a medical resident could be allowed to conduct the evaluation, but it has to be made clear to the patient that the assigned physician is still responsible and that having someone else perform the evaluation is outside the standard of care. And finally, if other emergency physicians are available, it's reasonable for all the physicians involved to decide amongst themselves whether to reassign the patient to another physician um, is, is uh, practicable within uh, uh, reasonable constraints. Um, and they can do so if doing so doesn't jeopardize the care of other patients. Uh, so for the patient in case study two, our Korean gentleman, this is in fact what the physicians did. They decided to accommodate his request. He then accepted care, made a full recovery, and went home. Now, regardless of which approach you take, it's imperative that you inform patients and families that hateful and racist speech won't be tolerated. In the last scenario, the patient's reassignment, uh, the patient's demand, reassignment demand was accommodated. But accommodation clearly isn't a perfect solution. And none of this is to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about bigotry or racism on the part of some patients or cases where the patient isn't just requesting concordance, but is explicitly rejecting a provider on the basis of uh, his or her ethnic and racial background, because this tends to negatively and disproportionately affect providers of color. And each time it happens, it's like another slice of the knife, and the cumulative effect can be significant. As you can imagine, these rejections are painful and demeaning um, for the physician involved, and they can exact a heavy emotional and psychological toll, and all of this contributes to burnout. So for example, I'll give you uh, a recent example. I'm from New York City. Um, uh, so a recent PEDS example from New York. A, a pediatric resident went into the room to meet her patient. She introduced herself, and then she got down on one knee to give the patient a high five, and just as she was about to do so, the father said, I don't want any black doctors touching my child. Don't you touch my child. I need a white doctor, I need one now. So even if the resident decides that she no longer wants to work with this family, the episode isn't over for her. The emotional and psychological toll will linger. Today we're in a patient-centered culture of care which is very important, but we can't forget first-line providers, which are often nurses, residents, and trainees. Um, so when these cases arise, there also has to be a formalized process in place. And this is particularly important when we're dealing with residents and trainees. A 2016 study from Stanford found that 19% of trainees experienced discriminatory verbal abuse. 93% uh, of over 400 first-year residents had experienced disruptive behavior, including racial bias. 15% had, uh, of residents had personally experienced or witnessed mistreatment. And among them, 50% said they didn't know how to respond to these encounters, while 25% said they didn't believe anything would be done if they alerted hospital management. So this tells us something. This, this, there doesn't seem to be enough institutional support for trainees or residents, or actually for nurses and doctors for that matter, when these cases often occur. Um, institutions really need to be there for these groups. They need to know that they'll be supported. 
that someone has their back. So first, when these incidents occur, um, particularly if we're dealing with trainees or residents, if a supervisor is present, um, then they might, want, they might want to wait a moment and see if the trainee or resident wants to handle the situation um, themselves. But if they don't, then the supervisor has to step in and let the patient know that the trainees and residents are uh, perfectly qualified to be doing what they're doing, and that hate, hateful speech won't be tolerated or condoned. And if she's able, if the supervisor's able, which also isn't always the case, but if they are, they should step out with a trainee or a um, resident and ask them how they want to proceed. And whatever they decide, it's important, it's imperative that the supervisor model appropriate behavior. Um, all right. And after the event, it's important to follow up and debrief by giving the affected staff an opportunity to talk about the incident, preferably one-on-one -on -one with a, a trusted point person on, on staff who has debriefing and facilitation skills. Because this is all about taking people's difficult experiences seriously. And it's important not to minimize the, the encounter. So supervisors and institutions really need to commit to understanding how members of the staff may have experienced the rejection. In addition to debriefing uh, with the rejected provider, the institution should also address the fact that these rejections can have a coercive effect on those who witness the encounter, but don't know what to do or how to respond. So you should probably, so you may want to have a whole team meeting. So those on the team who've had these experiences can talk about what's worked for them, what hasn't worked, people can share experiences. And this is important because prevention is impossible. So members of the team are probably gonna have this experience themselves or watch somebody else going through it at some point in their careers. And by these encounters, I mean not just rejections on the basis of race or ethnicity, but rejections on the base of disability status, religion, um, gender, age for that matter. Age is one of the most common rejections. You know, you look too young to be a doctor. I want somebody with more gray hairs. You know, give me somebody older. Um, so you need, so everybody needs to learn the skills to handle these situations. Another reason to have a team meeting um, is that members of the team may have no idea that this is happening to their colleagues. So you want to bring these instances to light, not only to inform the team, but also as a means of protecting the person who's experienced the rejection from internalizing it. Because these rejections can feel like an assault, and internalizing the rejection is more likely to happen if the person feels alone in the experience, or feels that they won't support, be supported, or that they'll be accused of being overly sensitive. Uh, because, for, again, for some providers, these encounters could be macroaggressions that come on the heels of several microaggressions. So supervisors and institutions have to support staff with an eye towards creating an appropriate future response. Um, so institutions should collect data on how often these occur and um, to get baseline information on how often they occur, the institution's response, the ultimate resolution, the effect on the physician, um, how personnel feel supported, um, and how the personnel feel about the institution's response. So you should have a real and meaningful systematic understanding and response. You know, make a prevalence map. You know, what, what, de what departments is this happening most often in? And all of this can be used to create best practices, because the more information you have, the better your response will be. Now, in order for these institutional uh, uh, changes to be most effective, they also have to include institutional culture change. So as we've seen with the recent tide of uh, sexual harassment allegations in the Me Too movement, many of the people coming forward and making these claims worked at uh, institutions that had um, anti-discrimination policies. They just didn't have a norm of reporting, of people coming forward and reporting sexual harassment. Sometimes the people didn't feel safe reporting. Other times they didn't feel perhaps that their claims would be taken seriously. Or they felt that the claims would somehow come back to bite them, negatively affecting their career trajectory. And the same can be said with regard to how healthcare workers, but particularly residents and trainees, for example, may feel about reporting their treatment by patients. So even with the best policies and protocols in place, a culture of non-reporting will undermine any meaningful change. As we know, norms play an important role in shifting behavior because conduct is governed less by formal rules than by patterns of behavior that have accumulated normative power over time. So supervisors and institutions need to be sensitive to this and work with institutions to, um, and work together to create a norm of reporting and a culture of supporting. And finally, 
the medical profession as a whole has to expand cultural awareness at all levels of practice and training so that providers can interact more effectively with various patient populations. Um, and the profession has to increase diversity, uh, beginning in medical school. And this should be done with an eye towards uh, encouraging tolerance and understanding of other cultures. So we need to create, we need to um, train a more culturally aware core of physicians. So I have eight seconds left. So really quickly, um, uh, but before all of this happens, I, I, I feel the, the five ethical guidelines that I've laid out, uh, along with a norm of reporting and a culture of supporting, um, are a clinically, ethically, and legally appropriate means of balancing the rights of interests of patients, providers, and healthcare institutions. So, thank you.